Hello and welcome back. In the previous lecture you learned how to animate different types of properties in A-Frame and in this lecture we are going to further customize the virtual environment by adding lights and shadows. As you can see I've already prepared our scene arranging several objects from different topics that we have covered so far and we have an A-Sky primitive that is temporarily set to a plain white color a customized ground that displays a texture and creates a perfect horizon, a custom camera with the position component attached to the wrapper entity, a GLTF 3D model that I created and I'm going to use as kind of a room that has a width of 4 meters and height of approximately 5 meters and a depth of 14 meters. Then we have an A image primitive that I included in the scene because of its particular behavior when it comes to lighting conditions, and a few static and animated A box primitives to cast some shadows. Okay, let's get started so we can finally talk about lights that, as you remember, I introduced in one of the very first lectures of this course when we had a look at how to install a frame. Indeed, if I open the DOM Inspector tool in Firefox, we can see all the objects in our scene and the two default lights with the data A-frame default light attribute injected by any A-frame scene. And you can find all the information about the default lighting in the development version of the A-frame JavaScript build file that you can download from the installation section of the A-frame documentation. So if I search for a data A-frame default light, We get to the lines of code of the light system, where you can see that until we create a new light in our scene, by default a frame will provide us with a one ambient light and a one directional light. And these two default lights will be removed as soon as we add the new one. If I scroll down, you can also read more details about their property values, like the color, the type of light, the intensity, and 3D vectors that are the VEC3 property values of the position component. Ok, I'm going to close the DOM inspector and go back to the HTML document so we can have a look at the different types of light that you can add to the A-frame scene. And I'll start by recreating the default lighting conditions. The first type of light that I'm going to add to the scene is the ambient light. So I create an empty entity, then I attach the light component which will automatically remove the two default lights from our scene and here you can further appreciate the behavior of the A image primitive which is not affected by the lighting conditions. So not only is the A image primitive ideal in a lit environment because it doesn't reflect the light but it also can be quite useful in dark or dim lighting conditions because it'll be fully visible. That is something that you may need for some UI elements, for example. Ok, back to our ambient light, I specify its value in the type property. And as you can see, the objects in our scene now are behaving just like the A image primitive because this type of light is a non-directional light that simulates indirect lighting in real life, so diffused, scattered or reflected light. And this is the reason why using an ambient light source alone to light up our scene makes the objects appear flat. But this type of light is quite important in 3D environments, and you can use it as a secondary light to add some realism to your scene, Otherwise the shadowed areas would appear fully black and we never have this condition in real life. And finally I set the color property to a triple B, that is the light grey color that we found in the A-frame JavaScript build file. Ok, we can now move on to the second default light, that is a directional light. And this type of light simulates an infinitely far away light source, such as the sun, where the light rays are coherent, parallel and shine from a specific direction. So I create an empty entity, then I attach the light component 
and specify all the properties uh, from the A-frame JavaScript build file. So type directional color white intensity 0 0.6 cast shadow true and nothing is still happening in our scene because we need to specify the position of the light source so I attach the position component to our entity and what counts here is the nature of this type of light Indeed, since directional lights are infinitely distant, absolute position has no effect on their intensity. For example, placing the light source to our right-hand side, specifying a value of a 1 meter or 10,000 meters, will produce the same effect. Therefore, in this case, only the vector matters. Ok, so when I set the 3D coordinates to minus 0 0.5, 1, and one, we have finally recreated the default lighting conditions in any A-frame scene. And as you can see, enabling the cast shadow property in the directional light is not enough to display shadows in our scene, because without the shadow component, the entities will not cast nor receive any shadow. But we'll have a look at this in a few minutes, as we are done with the default lights and it's now time to modify our scene with some custom lighting. So I comment the default lights we recreated and I reload the page where you can see them again being injected by the A-frame scene now. Then I set the sky color to a dark grey and I create the first custom light that is going to be an ambient light. So a entity, light component, type ambient, intensity 0 0.2. Then I add another custom light that is going to be a point light. And this is an omnidirectional type of light that behaves like a light bulb or a candle. Therefore, it simulates rays shining out from a single point in space in all directions. And to create a point light, I'm going to attach the light component to an empty entity again. Then I specify the type property value. And we can kind of see the light source in our scene at its default position of zero. Unlike directional lights, point lights affect other objects depending on their position and distance. So the closer they get to an object, the greater the object is lit. I'll move around so you can see better. And this is quite evident when I set the intensity to 0 0.8. On top of that, since different types of light include unique properties, you can specify the distance where the intensity becomes 0 with the distance property. That in this case I'm setting to 10 meters. Now that you have an idea of where our point light is, I reload the page and uh, move it up by 2 meters. So position component, 0, 2, and finally I place it 1.5 meter to our back, so 1.5. Okay, we are now ready to display shadows in our scene. So back to the light component, I enable the cast shadow property. Then I attach the shadow component to the orange box and enable its cast property because by default the shadow component will enable both receiving shadows from surrounding objects and casting shadows onto other objects. 
And since a lot of lights and shadows in your scene can be computationally expensive, you can and should enable these two properties independently. Then I do the same with the yellow box and the light grey panel. And finally I attach the shadow component to our ground. But this time I enable its receive property. Then I do the same with the blue room. And our real time shadows are there. Well, we can now move on and add one last custom light to our scene. That is going to be a spotlight. And this type of light is similar to the point light in the sense that it simulates light radiating from a single point in space and affects the objects in the scene depending on its position and distance. But point lights are not omnidirectional and indeed they have a cone of influence and cast light in one specific direction, just like the bat signal in the Batman movie. So to create a spotlight I'm going to attach the light component to an empty entity again then I specify its type uh, property value. And this time all we can see in our scene is the direction in which the light is being cast. But I'll come back to this at the end of this lecture. So I'll reload the page. And I set its position to 0, 3 and 1 to show you a very cool and unique property of a spotlight, that is the target property, that you can use to control the light direction conveniently and aim at a specific target, which in our case is going to be the orange box. And you can see this happening as soon as I reference its ID in the target property value using the query selector. Then I'm going to change the spotlight default to white color, trying to match this pink violet hue on the new Firefox Quantum logo. So C40070. And to further modify the spotlight cone, you can use the angle property that has a default value of 60 and that I'm setting to 30. You can also modify the percent of the spotlight cone that is attenuated due to penumbra using the penumbra attribute that by default is set to 0 and that I'll set to 0 0.1. Then I enable the cast shadow property and to really see the spotlight in action I'm going to add another animation to the orange box. So I copy and paste this code, clear the animation attribute and set its value to position, and I'm going to animate our box from its starting values of 1, 1 and 0, to 1, 1 and minus 2. Then I add the direction attribute and set its value to alternate. Finally, I remove the linear easing and when I reload the page you can see our spotlight keeping its eye on the orange box. And you can use the animation system with lights as well. As an example, I'm going to animate the intensity of the point light. So I nest the A animation element inside it and in the attribute value I use the dot syntax to specify the intensity property of the light component. Then I set the starting value to 0 0.8 and the ending value to 0. Then I use the same repeat direction and duration values of the orange box. And I finally reload the page. If you'd like or need for the A image primitive to be affected by the lighting conditions, as you learned in lecture 8, 
You can attach the shader attribute and set its value to standard. But here in our scene instead, as a reminder of its behavior, I'm going to attach the shader attribute to the yellow box. And then I set its value to flat. So this is how you can use lights and shadows to further customize your scenes. Just bear in mind that adding too many of them can be computationally expensive. And if you really need to, you want to take advantage of other techniques to fake the shadows cast by the objects in your scene, especially when they are stationary. For example, you could simply use PNG images and position them depending on the light direction. Or, as you learned in lecture 8 again, you could use uh, normal maps to fake depth details. That being said, a good place to start is combine an ambient light that by its nature casts no shadows, and a directional light that is the most efficient type of light for adding uh, real-time shadows. You can make some variations, of course, depending on your needs, and if you keep an eye on performance, you can achieve uh, great results. Because in VR, light and darkness can be extremely useful to provide the user with navigational clues, or extremely powerful if you'd like to make the user feel specific emotions. Okay, we've arrived at the end of this lecture. And it's been quite easy to move around the custom lights in our scene, even though the light sources are not visible. But what if you need to place them to a position for which you have no 3D coordinates, no reference at all? For example, a specific part of a 3D model. That would be pretty hard and surely take a lot of adjustments to place them almost correctly. Well, fortunately there is a very useful visual tool called the A-Frame Inspector, that will turn this task into a breeze. We are going to have a look at it in the next and last but not least lecture of this section, and I'll see you there.